evening. My name is Jerry Coppolo. Some of you might know me as Lama and Jerry. I'm the founder and resident manager of the Dharma Center of Winnipeg. And I thought I would introduce our speaker tonight, uh, who we invited here, um, by making the connection between um, meditation, which is what I teach, and the possibility of uh, climate collapse. It uh, might not be an immediate connection, but uh, I've been following Dr. Guy McPherson's blog, Nature Bats Last, uh, for several years. And in October, he put up a short video, four minutes, explaining his current position on the topic. Dr. McPherson is an uh, ecologist, earth scientist, uh, professor emeritus from the uh, University of Arizona, and knows what he's talking about, scientifically speaking. And uh, you'll get his views in a few minutes. But uh, what's the connection uh, with uh, climate change, climate collapse, and uh, the methods that uh, uh, the Buddha invented 3,000 years ago to investigate consciousness and to investigate reality. The Buddha was not a Buddhist. He was not a religious figure. He didn't deal in wishful thinking or magical thinking. Uh, he was a scientist of consciousness investigating uh, how consciousness works. And of all the practices that he invented, he said, or he said to have said, that some of the, the most effective practices at developing a disciplined mind uh, that can see clearly uh, what we're engaged in, and also developing a, a, a kind heart, a good heart, uh, and the tools to deal with what we see, and we're a group of meditation which I practice very much these days called the Asuba meditations. Uh, Asuba means repulsive or ugly. So the meditations on uh, the Asuba meditations dealt with meditations on death, meditations on uh, corpses, and so on. Uh, things that uh, you know people do all across North America on uh, watching CSI and their necrophiliac uh, pathologists dissecting bodies. Well, there's a way to do that, a disciplined way that uh, uh, leads to clear seeing and leads to a kind heart, if you can believe it. And uh, it struck me watching this four minute video that uh, Dr. McPherson put up that uh, five or six or seven years ago when he started uh, kind of went public with his views, he was a pretty unhappy guy. Uh, he was uh, you know, angry and uh, uh, alarmed at the degree of denial and the degree of ignorance out there about what's actually happening on the planet. But in five years, uh, he's turned into the guy you're going to see tonight. Warm-hearted, compassionate, insightful, and funny even. And it struck me that uh, although he didn't think he was doing it until I pointed out he's been doing it in a Suba meditation these five years, seven years, contemplating the death of a planet, contemplating the death of a species, of the death of many species, and just as the Buddha predicted, looking at what we're engaged in, understanding clearly what we're engaged in, um, leads to this uh, compassion, this willingness, this, this interest, this urge to assist other beings. It's really quite uh, moving to experience. And, and I thought that, well, let's, let's meet this guy and see what he has to say. So this is a um, presentation for serious-minded people who are willing to take a look at some hard facts. And uh, if you do, I hope you take uh, Dr. McPherson as your model and elect like to do what he's done, which is to work uh, to uh, help people deal with this in a wholesome, kind, productive way. So uh, I'll let him uh, tell you what he has to say, and I, I hope you come to the same conclusions about him and his views uh, that, that I've done. So thanks for showing up. So Guy, come and take over the podium here. Yeah. 
Thank you all for coming. Thanks especially to Jerry and Joan. I really can't stand still. I'm not sure when Woody Allen said this, but it looks like we didn't choose correctly. I should talk about Jerry's story just a little bit. What Jerry actually told me after we had made arrangements for me to come, he told me why I invited you is my teacher had us meditate on a decomposing body. And you've been doing that for a long time, so we should talk. And the first thing that comes to my mind is he needs a volunteer. And I'm thinking Winnipeg in, in February is going to take me forever to decompose. <laughs> but apparently he wasn't looking for that kind of volunteer. And it, it appears that we've gone down a path that leads us to human extinction in the not too distant future. We've had no humans on Earth at three and a half degrees above baseline. We are headed for more than three and a half degrees above baseline. And as a consequence, human extinction will result not because we're not lacking cleverness or adaptability. We're stunningly clever. We're stunningly adaptive. But we're going to run out of habitat. We're animals. We're human animals. Like other animals, we need habitat. And that habitat has got to include air and water and food and those, those fundaments that we take for granted. So that's where we're headed. I'll talk a little bit about that. We've had plenty of warnings. It was 1847 when George Perkins Marsh, American naturalist and ambassador, combination you hardly ever hear of these days, concluded that the effects of burning fossil fuels will be profound with respect to the urban heat island effect and also to global climate change. This is 1847. We didn't really start burning fossil fuels. Most people don't even think that we began the Industrial Revolution until a few years after that, right? So we were just getting started at that point. Centaur Arrhenius comes along a half, half a century later and predicts a one degree temperature rise by the end within 104 years. And he missed it by, oh, so little, stunningly. He thought it would be a good thing. Svante Arrhenius went on to win the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and he thought climate change would be a good thing because he lived in a Nordic region, and he was looking forward to the warmer temperatures and thought we'd be able to grow more food that way. But, that aside, he predicted with stunning accuracy the consequences of burning fossil fuels on global average temperature. Frank Capra, yes, that Frank Capra, the filmmaker, when he was working for GE, produced a film called The Unchained Goddess, in, in which, quote, he says, we're not only dealing with forces of a far greater variety than even the atomic physicist encounters, but with life itself. He warned about human extinction in a film he made in 1958, as a result of climate change from burning fossil fuels. The Assistant Secretary of Justice in the government of Salvador Allende in Chile in early 1973, and there's a long quote here, and I've taken the liberty of translating the translation from his native English, from his native language to English, into fewer words. What he's saying here is industrial civilization is degrading, exhausting, and enslaving, and it threatens to cause human extinction. That's 1973, that was a long time ago. So we've had warnings for a long time. If you want to look at a more rooted, a more fundamentally scientific warning, the last time we had a below average temperature for any month was February 1985. Now think about it for a minute. About every other month, it should be slightly below average. The probability without climate change of any month being below average is about 50%. The odds of having this many months in a row of above average global temperature exceed the odds of plucking a single atom from the entire universe. Long odds. Robert Watson, testifying to Congress in 1986, says we can expect significant changes in climate in the next few decades leading to human extinction. 
thanks to Alec Jones, the somewhat unusual character journalist, for pointing this out. I discovered this just a few months ago. Um, and Alex Jones was saying, see, it didn't happen. These guys are all loony. It's been a few decades. I'm not sure how you define a few decades. It's only been 28 years. But I don't think we're at a few decades yet, apparently, by Watson's guess. And finally, the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases in 1990 reports that beyond one degree C may elicit rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses that could lead to extensive ecosystem damage. So one degree C is a, is a significant threshold. And we've known this for a long time, 24 years now. In fact, James Hansen, the renowned climate scientist from the United States, finally, two months ago, concluded that his political target of two degrees C has been the wrong target the whole time. One degree C is what we need to worry about. I will argue that we've already crossed the Rubicon, that one degree C is irrelevant because we've triggered the kinds of consequences predicted by the United Nations Greenhouse Group in 1990. So we're at 0.85 above baseline right now, 0.85 degrees. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the renowned organization that won the Nobel Peace Prize for their work in 1987, with their, I mean, in 2007, with their fourth assessment, concludes we're headed for one degree C by 2100. Remember, the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases reports 24 years ago that beyond one degree C, we're in serious trouble. Had the Center for Meteorological Research comes along about a year later and says two C, is most likely. Bear in mind as we work through these large scale assessments done by these large reputable organizations that they, with each assessment, they have more data and they have more computational power. So Moore's Law indicates we double computing power in about 18 months. And so a year between assessments is actually quite a long time with respect to both computing power and the data at hand. United Nations Environment Program comes along mid-2009, says so 3.5 C by 2100. Remember, we haven't had humans on the planet 3.5 C warmer than baseline. Had this Center for Meteorological Research comes along a year after the previous assessment and says 4 is a new 2 and is coming by mid-century. This is huge. Global Carbon Project and Copenhagen diagnosis um, coincident with the COP15 meetings in Copenhagen thrown under the bus by the Obama administration and their allies, includes six or seven degrees temperature increase by 2100. United Nations Environment Program comes along years ago now, says up to 5C by 2050. A couple of things to keep in mind about these assessments, which now include more recently the United States Department of Defense in their quadrennial or every four year assessment climate change is among the great security threats facing the United States. Something to keep in mind is none of these assessments take into account collapse of this set of living arrangements. None of them take into account any significant positive feedbacks either, or self-reinforcing feedback loops. And finally, the IPCC with their fifth assessment, which is due out this year, but which has already been heavily leaked, concludes that global warming is irreversible without massive geoengineering of the atmosphere's chemistry. So they say we've already triggered so many self-reinforcing feedback loops, none of which are accounted for in this fifth assessment, none of which were accounted for in the fourth assessment either. The major feedback loops are not accounted for. But they say we've triggered those kinds of, <coughs> of events and we need to implement geoengineering. Let's think about geoengineering for a moment. Remember what they said, global warming is irreversible without massive geoengineering of the Earth's atmosphere. According to a paper in the journal lecture that came out shortly thereafter, climate geoengineering cannot simply be used to undo global warming. So we need to implement geoengineering according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They didn't indicate what kinds of geoengineering would be required, or they didn't even make suggestions. But according to a journal article that came out, almost immediately thereafter, geoengineering probably isn't going to work. It's bolstered by another paper to come out the same month. Geoengineering may succeed in cooling the Earth, but it's also going to disrupt precipitation patterns to such an extent that 
that it's, it's a monster out of the box. We, we shouldn't go there. Piling on, you know, referee General Dozier, from just last month, attempts to reverse the impacts of global warming by injecting reflective particles, which is the most commonly proposed geoengineering strategy, into the atmosphere could actually make matters worse. And finally, from page paper in Nature Climate Change, uh, again last month, the overall public evaluation of climate engineering is negative, so people aren't interested. It almost certainly won't work, and people are not interested. It's necessary, according to the incredibly conservative IPCC, but it won't work, and we're not interested in implementing. So it appears that, in fact, we've triggered runaway greenhouses. Clyde Hamilton points out in his latest book that without the sulfates associated with industry, when, when the age of industry is done, Earth will be an extra 1.1 C warmer within three days. We're at 0.85 C right now. That takes us to the, to the political target of 2 C in a matter of days. And 2C, as we know, triggers all kinds of nasty behavior in the climate that we don't want to have anything to do with. John, Baby, John Davies, writing for the Arctic Methane Emergency Group last September, says, quote, the world is probably at the start of a runaway greenhouse event which will end most human life on Earth before 2040. He's taking into account none of the self-reinforcing feedback loops I'm going to talk about. He's just considering carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which currently covers at about 400 parts per million for the first time in the human experience. <coughs> Good news, none of these include collapse of the set of living arrangements. Bad news, they don't include positive feedback, self-reinforcing feedback loops either. So all of these assessments are missing much of the story. If we think about those positive feedbacks for a minute, first of all, collapse leads to 1.1c, which takes us to 2, 1.95, let's call it 2. 2c above baseline in a week. Paul Beckwith, a uh, climate scientist at, here in Ottawa, says that we, we, we could experience a 6 degrees C increase within a decade. I can guarantee there will be no humans on the planet 6 degrees warmer than baseline. And we could be there in a decade. About a year later, he says up to a 16 C increase within a decade or two, based on his evaluation of historical evidence. When we talk about rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses, that's what we're looking at. Profound changes in a very short period of time. Climate change has gone well beyond linear. We cannot simply track the past and extrapolate that forward using a linear approach anymore. According to the Proceedings of the National